Ready? Freaks out. Yeah, freak out. I'm, I'm gonna freak out. I'm gonna freak out. Hello, and welcome to Rhythm and Pixels, a video game music podcast. This is episode 28-5 of the show. And we are your hosts. My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm going to freak out. He's going to freak out. Freak and out. Every week we listen to great... We freak out. Every week we freak out. No. Every week we listen to great video game music from all consoles and all generations, except this month or this this season, this this year is the not summer. this year. You did it. No way. Well, not the whole year, but this, this, this summer. This summer. This, this block of time. This summer. This summer is the summer of 16-bit. Which means we're locking ourselves into 16-bit games where... Oh, and, and 8-bit. But it's the summer of 16-bit. Uh, well, that's what I said last week, and you were like, well, I mean, like, <laughs> we could do both. No, no, no. What I was saying, though, I'm good with 8-bit, mind you, but no, what I was saying was uh, <laughs> I can go the back. idea of, like, <laughs> games that were released recently that were done in the style of 16-bit. Oh, right. That's where I was like, yeah, but no, I want to do classic. I did all classic stuff. Oh, I did, too, because nothing, right now, nothing, there's nothing I could think of that's 16-bit and hits this topic. Oh, okay. That was released recently, but uh, but like it was it was like a month or so ago. You 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 got into a rental car that was playing the summer of '69, yeah. And you were like, "Oh, that's awesome! The summer of 16-bit." And we should do a bunch of episodes that are just like real simple topics, mm-hmm. like ending music, you know, that, stuff stuff like we did at the beginning of the show. Yes, and it would be interesting too because uh, I already noticed that there's something about like I like. I feel like I realized while picking tracks for this episode even that I've gotten so accustomed to doing like game reviews and just drowning in games all the time with stuff to play that I end up picking a lot of stuff from games I'm experiencing, whether they're new or old, just games I'm experiencing at the time because I'm trying to always carry a log, a backlog or something. Right. But now it's like, well, you have to really go back to your roots because you haven't played any of the games you're bringing up in like 10, 20 years. Yeah, now you're, now you're in my house. <laughs> exactly, and it's, and it's a house that I don't want to be in because it's really crowded, and the lights are too dim, and you keep stepping on, they keep kicking that side of the table, you know, where your toe hits it, and then you're freaking out because it's really sensitive there, and <laughs> I, it drives me crazy. But at the same time, I'm yeah. no chicken. I'm yeah. no, ch- I'm no coward, Rob. If I can I, roll with anything. Look, if I'm a chicken, then you're a turkey. Yeah, you know, yesterday. That's I, right, you beef jerky. You beef jerky. Oh, I like that. Um, yesterday I tripped on my dog's um, like toy bone, and it was the most painful experience. <laughs> well, at least you didn't trip on the dog's tail, because that would have been painful for two uh, parties. Like so she'll she'll play on it with it, and then she'll leave it out, and I'm like, okay, blah blah blah, and it's just like. Usually I'm wearing shoes, and I'll trip on it, and that's one thing. But like my my shoe was off. And it was br- it was rough, it was rough. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear lord. Um. Okay. So but I meant to. I gotta bring up too because I totally remembered it, and also because it's driving me nuts. Been a big frustrating point of my day. What's up? Uh. So last week, uh, on that day, I had put up an auction to sell some cards on the internet. Oh, on our record day. Yes. Yeah. It was on the record day. Oh yeah. How'd that go? Because I need money. We need an we need an update. And the update is it sold today and then the person immediately backed out of the sale. Oh. And then as a result, that person actually drove up the price of the auction, which means that the people that bid under him weren't particularly jazzed about being like second chance bidders. So I had to relist the actual item again. Mm. And then I ended up actually trying to go back to uh like the like a collective group of people that are collectors of this stuff, and I was like, "Hey, here's the person. If you want to want to watch out for this person, they um oh they just backed they, out. They, they backed out. Yeah. Here's their username and all that. Oh yeah. And then the website gave me like a name for the person, which I then mentioned, and oh. that became a whole thing where it was like, "That's not. That's no way. That was him. I know that guy. He's a good dude. So it became this whole thing where the guy messaged me. A bunch of people came in and were like, "Val, Val, I'm vouching for him." And keep in mind, I stated. In my notification, I said, it's very possible someone used this guy's name to make him look bad mm. because the account had zero karma and it was created like last month. So I'm like, it's very possible if someone just used his name if he's, since he's a regular member of this community. Yeah, but everyone's like, you called somebody, like, calling somebody out. To, uh, yeah, but at the same time, they couldn't, they couldn't be mad at me for it because the first guy was like, what gives, why, well, what reason well, do you have to, to name this person? Well, were they mad at you for it? No, 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 because <laughs> the first person 
outright came at me and said, "What? Are, what right do you have to call off this person? Like, why do you feel you have the right to do so?" And I again clarified, I was like, "It might not even be him, mm-hmm. but I'm basing it on this." And I took a photo and said, "They're telling me that's the name of the account." And then here's where it gets funny, funny. So after all those people were vouching for him and all, and they all knew who he was, and I found the profile that the guy had, his real profile, whatever. Turns out it's not even his real name because it's a pseudonym of a name. And I'm like digging. I'm like, I didn't even know that was a fake name. The guy was like, yeah, it's based off of like a character from like Office Space. And I'm like, but I never knew that character's full name. So how would I know? (laughs) And then like it became this whole thing where I learned that a lot of people on auction sites and just in general, like I already knew about like people on like Facebook don't use their real names half the time. But like on those things. But like on those things they don't. And I'm like, is it the world we live where you can't use your real name anywhere? Like... Who the heck is the, where's your cred, where's your credibility yeah. if you don't even have a real name listed anywhere? I, I kind of get it, but I also like at some point, like in the last three or four years, I just gave up and just use my real name everywhere. Like my Twitter handle is my real name, my website is my real name, my, I, even my Discord handle is my real name. And most of the time, like I'm that Which way probably too, like, a bad idea, but I don't know. No one, nothing's happened yet. Like, but I, I'm I'm an old white. And in my like, case, I'm I've got fortunate. little yeah. death threats, and I still do it. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm like uh, I know I'm I, like, I know I have the privilege of that, but also like I just I I couldn't keep up with like where am I named here and where am I named here and then also this name is like not the most professional sounding thing in the world. Then why would I use this non professional sounding thing in my forties? It know? became complicated. It became complicated. It became comp- I don't even remember what handle I used back in like high school. Like what did I even use? Robozord or something. Baz Boy or something crazy. Like that. <laughs> I can't remember. Rocket Pop. We had we had we in IRC we had some names and now I can't say them on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure anybody is listening probably knows them all because it's the same thing every teenage boy uses on like the internet when they can type for the first time. Like, oh boy, I'm going to be edgy. Check um, this out. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was like, but these nice. are nice. But the IRC servers were like just us and like that was it. So it's like they're being edgy, but like just to each other. <laughs> we, were just, we were just being stupid is what we were doing. So it's funny that like our prequel episode, if you're a Patreon member, you get a prequel episode. We actually talk about video games. And then on the actual show, we talk about like eBay and garbage pail kids cards. Well, in this case, I feel like since you mentioned it on the regular episode last week, I was like, I feel like it may as well be mentioned yeah, on the regular episode this absolutely. week too. It um, just yeah. needs to be done. But I relisted it. I hope it sells this time. I hope so too. Because I want that green. You get the, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta make investments, Rob. I got, I got dollar dollar bills. Get that bread. You got anything else you're trying to get rid of? I'm still trying to sort that out because, yeah, like, for we example... Use, we can use the show to get the word out. <laughs> well, for example, one thing that came out... Oh, that's weird. I got an email saying it's the summer of Purnell. That's very freaky because now we're doing, like, a summer <laughs> episode right now. You're like, it's not the summer of Purnell. Purnell. It's the summer of 16-bit. Yeah, um, you get it right. <laughs> All right, so the summer of 16-bit starts with platformers, as it should, right? That's right, because 16-bit platformers were, like, kind of the thing. I feel like... If you were to lay down a table of games released based on broken down by genre, yeah, I think platformers would eclipse all the others. Probably the most accessible. Everyone can pick one up and be like, this button jumps, this button does something else. Also, it was the easiest to slap a mascot on, which was another big thing. People had mascot mania back then. Anthropomorphic talking animals was a big thing. Is that your first one? No. Actually, believe <laughs> it or not, none of mine have anthropomorphic talking animals. I'm disappointed. Yeah, but I see that's more of a challenge. Think about that. <laughs> How hard that had to be to do. All right, but, what, what's your first track then? So I actually hit multiple consoles on this. So my first track comes from the Turbo Graphics, actually. Um, this comes from the game Valus 3, and the track title is called Valus Sword, and it was composed by Hisao Inoue, Jun Hasabi, and Shingo Murakami. <laughs>
back. You're listening to Valus Sword from the game Valus 3 from the Turbo CD. It goes by, I believe, Hisao Inoue, Jun Hasabi, and Shingo Murakami. And if I'm wrong, well, guess what? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, this game, technically, Rob thought it was sort of cheating because it was like Sega C- it was Turbo CD Red Book Audio. I'm like, well, I gotta slip that in there somewhere. Yeah, it, but it counts. I got 8-bit stuff going on today, so that's alright. <laughs> oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, but technically, the game itself is a 16-bit game because um, it was also released on the Sega Genesis. So, the OST is different, but the game is the same. So, I am a huge fan of the Valus game. Oh, I don't want to say huge fan because... I mean, the games themselves were fairly straightforward. They were basically like action platformers. They're just platformers, but for the style, they were nice because they kind of carry like an overarching story as you played through. So after you beat a level, characters would have conversations. Mm. Sometimes you'd come across characters in the level that would give you dialogue if you talk to them. Because um, they were originally based off of like, well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, they were originally spawned off of Eroges and then became like actual platformers. Interesting how that like. <laughs> how it went from one place to another. It really did. Like it's yeah. and the fact I think that the last game was like that, which is why we never no one ever talks about it because they went back to the other stuff. Right. Like, and oh, we're we, saying more like adult game. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what they story they, they, driven. Yeah. It's surprising yeah. how many games have had that history if you look hmm. back on them. But Ballas is actually getting recently talked about too because the original holders of the license have recently crowdfunded the attempt to put Valus 1, 2, and 3 on the Nintendo Switch. So will be this will be the first time Valus has seen a release since like the mid-90s mm. or early 90s even. So oh, wow. That'll be nice I to guess see them get a return to the light. I'm thinking about its history, and it's making me think about the the turbo graphics or the PC engines and NEC hardware. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's Hudson Soft, but it's Hudson Soft and NEC. And NEC created the PC-88 and the PC-98 mm-hmm. and then the PC Engine. So maybe like the developers of like all of those, you know, uh, uh, kind of shady adult games on the PC ninety eight moved over into the PC Engine territory. It's possible. I mean, I feel like I recall something about them getting like the, the ownership of this property dancing around a bit too, which might factor. I know it's Telnet, but there was a company before Telnet hmm. that owned the rights to Valis. It's been a while since I looked into this. In fact, I was surprised. I was like listening to the music. I was like. I remember this track. It plays while you're on a boat. <laughs> and I had to go back and look. I looked for like a long play because I'm not going to boot the game up again anytime, so I'm too busy. But I went and looked up a long play, and I was like, let me get to the boat stage. And I'm like, there it is. There's the boat. And I'm like watching. I was like, I remember all of this. And the next stage was the climbing the tower. And sure oh. enough, the next stage was climbing the tower. I, I really like this track. It's every. It's just a. It's such a high tempo. Like, it's high energy. When I looked up the song, I found an arranged version by a mistake. And I think we're going to end the show with that because it's really good. It's really smooth. And the funny thing about this, too, is and that... you were like, this ain't the song. I'm like, are you sure, Pernod? <laughs> this is not so I really like this. The thing is, I'm still thinking it might have been the Genesis version of the track. But well, when we listen to it again, we'll find out. But like The one I played before? Yeah, it sounded like it might have been the Genesis No, no, it was... No, it was... I looked it up. <laughs> it was totally arranged? It was an arrangement album, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those, all those um, er- erotic video game fans... But one thing that's interesting Formed a about jazz band and <laughs> a jazz <laughs> fusion band and made it like, oh, let's, let's make some music. But like the last thing I'll mention about this, I think is interesting is that as you get older, I guess you, people like to say you know, your taste in music changes and shifts around, mm-hmm. which is, I think is honestly true in ways. Um, but it's funny that it transferred to this because when I went in looking, I had the track in mind that I wanted to play for the show because it was my favorite track back when I used to play the game proper. But then I was listening to the whole OST and I was like, wait a minute. I like this one more. I didn't like it more back then, so why do I like it more now? So it was a very odd thing to reckon. I was like, my taste in music has shifted away from that track to this track. Yeah. Why? You still like tracks from the game, though. Well, I still yeah. like all the tracks. It's just my favorite is no longer the other one anymore. Around, yeah. It's this one. Well, so my next track also takes place on water, and it's a game that I found and I wanted to play because I had never heard of this before. It's called High Seas Havoc. For the Sega Genesis. Have you heard of this one? No. It's definitely one of those mascot hop and bops, um, as he would call them. I, <laughs> and I call them out, hop and bops. Um, this is called Going On an Adventure. It's for the Sega Genesis, composed by Emi Shimitsu and Masaki Iwasaki. It's a Data East title. So let's go. Hop and bops are the best drops.
and we're back here listening to Going on an Adventure. And this sounds like an adventure for the game High Seas Havoc for the Sega Genesis, composed by Emi Shimitsu and Masaki Iwasaki. And this is a game of a cute little seal pirate. He's a seal? He's a little seal. But yeah. he's got feet. But he's got feet. Yeah, of course he's got and he's feet. got hands. He's got, he's got, I mean, I don't How know. How would why. he hold a sword with his flippers? Uh, I mean, he's with an, his fins. They're anthropomorphic, which means. I never just like. He feet, does, if he's a hands. seal, he needs to have <laughs> he needs to have the dorsal fins. He can't have. Well, I guess they're flippers. Are they flippers or fins? So if this were like what you're thinking, this would be a bust of a hop and bop and more of a slip and slide. Oh, Honestly, I'd love to play that. <laughs> I'm surprised. Well, I guess if that game, if a game did that, it'd be too easy. You yeah, just yeah, slid yeah. into enemies instead of actually having to bop them. Because bopping takes precision. Sliding, it's like, bleh, yeah. hot stuff coming through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm slamming through everybody. Um, yeah, I don't but know. I guess I, that's what Wario does, technically. I, technically, he's, he'll turn into a giant monster and just roll over people, right? I know. He just he body slammed. He, he shoulder oh, checks. Yeah. Sorry, he shoulder checks. Shoulder checks him. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's a hockey player. Um, but no, I've, I've never, I can't believe this one I've never heard of before. Like, it must have been like a late in the cycle, life, life cycle of the Genesis. It's really colorful and it's really, really cute. And, um, and the music is, th- these tracks are super long and I feel like, like we're, we're listening to this song with headphones. And if you're listening to the show, like I really encourage you to listen to it in the car or with headphones on because there's like lots of cool little percussion and really fun stereo effects popping left and right. And I'll tell it's hopping you. and bopping on your head. <laughs> and I gotta say, like, I've been getting like through this whole topic kicking in. I've been like trying to like boot up more games. It's like even if it's just to look at them and play like a stage or two to see what they were like that I missed out on before. And that's one thing I can appreciate like emulation for in that regard. Because like, you can just have a day where you sit down and just plumb through like this entire catalog of classic games from a bygone era. Yeah. And she's like, this is, what the, this is what the kids used to play back in the day. Or in the unfortunate case of like people who were like 45 in like the 80s or 90s. Hey, this is, what, this is what grown men used to play back in the 90s. And I only say that because now that means that they're either like, they're not, they're pretty old and they're old folks' homes playing, trying to play PS5. Like, well, that's going to be games. us like like in the 70s. We're going to be like, what, what were you playing like PlayStation 10? This is what we used to play back in the day. And it's like Jet Set Radio. But maybe we'll <laughs> luck out. And when that time comes, we'll just be able to hook it up to our heads and just like, we don't need our hands to play anymore. We just like use like our brains to process this. So even though our hands, we have like arthritis. And I'll, I'll still fight against that because I still don't like touch screens no, for games. No, like, I'm saying you'll have arthritis. And oh, you won't oh, be able I won't to be do able like to. You used to. I mean, I'll figure out a way. You, you know, <laughs> we, you know that we'll figure out a way. <laughs> Mechanical measures. Yeah, like just give me my robo hands. Like we'll make we'll make the controllers like we'll get custom. Like we'll start having like there's like a custom aftermarket of controllers that fit like our claws. Of hands well, that we yeah. barely have to move our. But then, muscles. how will we eat Cheetos? Um, that's um, that's a good question. It's a very very important yeah. question. I, I don't have an answer to that one. <laughs> and I know before I wouldn't have been like Cheetos because that's that's stereotypical. But now they make the hottest puffs, and now I do eat Cheetos. Well, maybe so I can I get like a, like a tube, and then they can just like run through the tube to my mouth. But I guess that's what that makes sense. Cause if we're, and, in, and, if we're in a nursing home. We'll have people that can help us. And not like like liquefied and like shoved through a tube. I mean, like I want you, the crunchy. Yeah, you know, like um, those those tubes, those post like the post office that like. <laughs> oh, geez, like <laughs> like a vacuum tube. Might not have time to and chew. You it. Stick it'll just the like vacuum sh- slam down your throat. Yeah, you put the vacuum tube in your mouth, and then someone on the other end shoots Cheetos into your mouth, and then they vacuum, they close it up, they they, they put up, they, they stamp it. They it, stamp the Cheeto. Well, it's got to go across state lines. It just goes through the no folks well, home. Until it's legal in Delaware, we can't do this. Oh, dear Lord. So you're talking about contraband. There's legislation we got to get passed. Well, I don't think it'll be too hard to pass that legislation. The, vac- the, the vacuum, vacuum Cheeto Cheetos legislation. It'd be, that's probably one of the easiest pieces of paper to kick across the desk. This music's making me come up with some weird stories. Well, that's, a, that's what happens <laughs> when you're in, involved in high seas havoc. It's the high seas havoc. Um, all right, scurvy. Scurvy's a big issue. <laughs> high seas havoc and scurvy. All right, what's your next track? And just for the record, we still have to do that pirates versus ninjas pairing up episodes. Oh, I thought we had done that for some reason. We never did it. We should get, for some reason. I feel like Alex needs to be on that. Is he a big proponent of pirates and/or ninjas? I don't know. 
<laughs> he's Smart the, to ask him. He's now. the messenger, so I mean, he's got to be—he's got to represent the, the 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 ninjas. Well, if that were to happen, then we need someone to represent pirates. Who who's in the, who in the VGMC is a pirate? Like Ed the Buccaneer? A uh, Matt. <laughs> Matt's the pirate. How is he the pirate? Because he pirates. Oh, touche. <laughs> Oh, dear Lord. No, wait, no. He (laughs) he legally emulates. Okay. (laughs) So the next track... What's your next track? ...is actually one of my... A game I've brought up on the show many times, but surprisingly, we've only played, like, one track in the entire shit game from the show. No kidding. It's always surprising when we run across something like that. And if I'm wrong, that means that it just didn't show up in my searches. Um, This comes from the game Kid Chameleon. Ooh. Um, This is the pirate stage theme. And it's composed by Mark <laughs> Miller. Wait a minute. You got a pirate stage? No, so, oh, pyramid, pyramid. Oh, pyramid. I thought you said pirate stage. That would have been pretty freaking hilarious. I'm mean, like, oh my God. So your first game was in the water. Then my game was pirates on a boat. And then your next game, well, oh, next pyramids. So you sailed the pyramids. Oh, oh, yeah. It's an adventure still. Going on an adventure. Pyramid stage. Kid Chameleon. Kid Chameleon. never played this track before nope this is a funk track fun fact about this track this is another case of what i was talking about before which is that uh back in the day when i originally played kick a million pyramid theme by mark miller that other way <laughs> on the second genesis on the second genesis um when i used to play this game this these were some of my least favorite least enjoyed stages because i thought the track was boring oh slow right yeah it's very slow yeah maybe we just track. maybe we just appreciate slower music now it's not even so much the slower it's just i appreciate more of what it's doing in it like there's there's a lot going on in this track it's got like a bootsy collins that's so good because originally when i picked this game i was going to pick the cave theme Mm -hmm. which is like which is also a great track and for a while it was my favorite track that in the city theme but the city theme is what we did play on the show in the past um but going back listening for the scope of this episode i was like you know I think I like the pyramid theme a lot more than I used to. So, all the stages in Kid Chameleon were, well, themed. So, you can see there's probably like 15 stages that are pyramid themed. Uh, Different arrangements of tiles and enemy types and all that will pop up. There was like city theme. There was the yeah. valley theme. Yeah, you played it. You you played. I had like a, a collection of Genesis titles on the on the 360. And you came to my condo and just like played through this game, like almost to the end. Yes, yeah, it was cool. It's addictive. It's such a good game, and it, I think it holds up um, because it does that thing that I almost wish. I guess nowadays people might even call it a played out trope, but I wish more games did it. Where you're a kid who yeah. goes into the video game. To save the day because the video game actually became evil and it started kidnapping yeah. children and enslaving them. <laughs> so this the coolest kid in the arcade, Kid Chameleon, I think it's funny that he even has that name because the powers he has only exist in the game. But right, I digress. Right. But he, he can like take take the the powers of the other like enemies and stuff, right? Well, like there's special helmets. Yeah. And if he picks up the helmet, he becomes what the helmet represents. I guess that's where the chameleon rolls in. Mm. But uh, it was a cool concept for a game. It was very intriguing, and it had a lot of stages. They claimed it at 100. I don't think it actually did, because there's actually people 
who have mapped out every stage Wait, and the trajectory you can take to get through the game. It's a maze. That game is, is massive. Yeah, there's warps that'll take you backwards. I know. When you told me that, I was like, oh, that would drive me crazy. Because mm-hmm. some of these levels are difficult. Um, remember, like, how back in the 90s, we thought virtual reality was going to be, like, everything. Like, you're inside the world, you know? And now the closest that we've gotten many years later is keep talking or everybody explodes. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, we've gotten pretty close. There's some, like, like, the Beat Saber and stuff. Like, there's some interesting things. But, like, when they were talking about this stuff in the 90s, and you put, like, a headset on, and it's like, oh, my God, there's five triangles floating around in these like in these these computer screens that are super close to my face but no and the, but the thing is like in those movies it went well beyond it like they'd put the helmet on oh in the movies and they would oh, do yeah, that movies, thing yeah. where they would like, they would look at their hands and their hands now were like flippers or fins or <laughs> yeah. i'm going to go back to that and uh they were like flippers or fins I'm like wow now i have fins and the world is like down there underwater mm-hmm. and they act like they're actually underwater they act like they can feel mm-hmm. and they're truly involved in the place they're in and that ever happened. That would be an amazing VR game or VR experience if they were to make that now. Like, an, like if they made it now to be like a '90s one, where it was like just goofy enough to be like, oh my god! It's, like you put your helmet on, and suddenly it's like, oh my god! Thank God you're here. The computer is in trouble. You have to stop. Them. I would play the living daylights out of it. <laughs> have you seen? Um, there, there, Jeez. There's 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 like gifts around of um, Angela Lansbury with a VR headset. But there's a from there, murder she wrote. Yeah, from there's a murder she wrote episode where she like solves her murder in VR, <laughs> and it's worth it just to have her with a VR helmet and like these these like essentially two power gloves on her hands. Like <laughs> <laughs> she's like manipulating. I gotta <laughs> save him before he gets killed in the VR world. It's pretty amazing. Um, if he dies in the game, he dies for real. Shout outs to Angela Lansbury. And our next track is gonna be. Uh, so I'm going back to 8-bit because I thought for some reason that's what we were doing. But don't worry, next week. <laughs> next week I know better. All right, so, but we're going to do this anyway. If we do 8-bit, we'll actually refer to this second half of summer, it, 16-bit, 8-bit it'll be, summer. It'll be the autumn of 8-bit. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, but the summer of 16-bit, I'm um, going a little bit back. This is for the NES. This is the Kickmaster because I like the name Kickmaster. <laughs> the old rule of the Max Schooler. Yeah, um, sec- sector, hell of a, sector 7, a long way from home, the kick master, kick faster for the NES, Nobuyuki, yeah, Iazuki, sorry, Nobuyuki Iazuka and Yasuke Takahama, um, and this is just a fun soundtrack. So kind of a, a little short, short guy there. This is Sector 7, a long way from home. Kickmaster. Kickmaster. He's nothing else. Not punches. Not jumps. Not magic. Not the roundhouse kickmaster. He, he's all kicks. Yeah, all kicks. Just just the boot. He's just, he's just all boots. <laughs> all the time. This all was, Collins. This is on the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, composed by Nobuyuki Iazuki. Iazuki. I want to say Iazuki. Iuzaka. And Yasuke Takahama. For some reason, I just took it back to Bootsy Collins again. You know, that's true. We got a thread here. So it's the Bootsy Collins and Kid Chameleon. And this guy is um, Bootsy Master. <laughs> the Kick Master, but he wears boots. Yeah, the Kick Master with the Bootsies. With the booties. Like uh, Collins. I think, he's like, I think he is like a wizard, but like his, his, his magic comes from his kicks. Kick magic? Yeah, kick magic. That would be really tough to pull off when you think about like... <laughs> I can kick. I can send um, wind, uh, wave blades of wind out, but only when I throw a kick. It's like okay, so if you need to do a rapid stream mm-hmm. of wind blades, you have to just kick that fast. Yeah, uh, I can tell you right now, I've been doing like low kick, high kick streams on the side. Those are really hard to do in quick succession. You can't say that right now. You can't do a Chun Li uh, lightning kick. No one can do a Chun Li. Like <laughs> actually, I forget there was that one woman who actually did do what is likely the closest to a human pulling that off. 
where she like kind of like she had one foot on the ground and she would just kind of keep she would spin it left to right to move herself forward and then her other foot was just constantly kicking like forward uh. in three angles and it was like how in the <laughs> like admittedly if she did that to somebody I don't think it would hurt them much because she's working so hard to stay balanced and all that she's probably not putting a ton of force into those kicks Yeah. and one of those landing on a person would likely throw her off balance yeah someone just sweep sweep the other leg or not even to sweep <laughs> I mean literally if she kicked and connected one of those kicks, her balance would get thrown off mm-hmm. and just des- ruin the entire kick. But from a just display showpiece, though, it was it's really fun. cool yeah. to see because it took a lot to pull that off. There's like, a guy on Twitter that does, um, like, he dude, he does is he recreates all the He's like a martial artist guy, but he recreates the moves of, like, players from Tekken. Oh, I saw that. And I'm like, that's pretty rad. Like, that's, that's the, cool. The Capoeira guy from the game, Eddie, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. That was the coolest one to watch because yeah. he was doing all of those crazy like, moves. He had all of them, man. He's, like, it was really, really impressive. Um, he's a kick master. No, he's the everything master. He's the everything master. <laughs> it was definitely another case, though, like where, like, despite his body pulling it off and as amazing as it looked for him to do it, it still had you thinking, like, those guys can't damage anyone with these moves. Like, <laughs> it takes enough just to do the motion, but you have no force behind it. Yeah, is that, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, he's throwing his weight around on some of those kicks, but... But the Capoeira guy where he's just kind of, like, on the floor like a, like a dolphin, like, yeah, flopping yeah. around with his dorsal fins. Or the, the drunken kung fu guy. He's like, I'm, oh, I'm drunk. You can't fight me because I'm going to be, I want to hit you. <laughs> in the face. <laughs> See, you're supposed to throw him off by thinking that you're drunk. But the when truth the reality is you're is, just really drunk. That you're drunk. There was, um, was it, uh, Legend of Drunken Master 2 with Jackie Chan was really good because they actually got into how he was only an effective fighter when he was drunk. And then at the end, of, towards the end of the movie, like he didn't want to anymore because he was just an alcoholic. So he has to once he finishes his, the final yeah, mission, he's something like, I'm done like drinking. that. Yeah, it was like that, or it was like uh, it was such a slippery slope that he had to keep fighting to like save people, but he didn't want to because it meant that he would be like he would get sick or something. I don't know. It was it was a weird Jackie Chan movie, a good one though, because he's because it's Jackie Chan and he's going to do those moves. Sequel, like Legend of Sober Master. Yeah, yeah. He fights with AA chips. Oh God. All right, so we're on your last track, right? Mm-hmm. All right, so what, what, what kind of kick master are we going to see this time? Actually, no kicks involved here, but a very slow businessman. This is a game I've actually... Um, <laughs> slow businessman? I've heard of this game quite a bit here and there, and I read up on it. I slow watched videos of it, people man. talking about it. What is this? And uh, I got reminded of it on the actual Discord recently. Which got me thinking about it. And I was like, I got to pick from this game. Got to pick from this game. So here we are. On Discord, too. I mean, I look at that every once in a while. Well, I guess he's not so much a businessman as an employee. Employee. That being George Jetson. Oh, that's right. Guy gets no respect. Yeah, he gets You may as well have been voiced by Ronnie Dangerfield. (laughs) Uh, I'm telling you. This game, (laughs) this is called, this is from the game Jets, the Jetsons, Invasion of the Planet Pirates. This is the theme for the Spacely Space Rocket Stage 1. And it's composed by Hideki Takahagi, or ta- yeah, Takahagi, and Mitsuhido Tanaka. Welcome back 
you are most likely bopping into the living daylights of your head there. Um, bop into the track Spacely Space Brockets, stage one from the game Jetsons, Invasion of the Planet Pirates on the Super Nintendo, composed by Hideki Takahagi and Mitsuhito Tanaka. So, again, like, this is a game, I don't even remember how it came across, came to my attention, like, maybe a couple months ago or a year or two ago. Actually, it would have had to have been at least two years ago because when I looked at it originally, I was still coming here, so pre-COVID. Um, but it just, see, it was one of those games that I never heard of until I came across it in discussion. So it kind of stuck to me. And then we were talking in the Discord group about the idea of like, I don't remember how I came up, but it was a discussion of like oh. the Jetsons and the Flintstones. Yeah, I, I came in at the end of that the discussion where you guys were talking about the Jetsons and the Flintstones and how they have the crossover. And then I was like, oh yeah, that's right. He was always getting fired. And I was like, you're fired. Fired, oh, huh? he only got he didn't get fired to me. Telling people he was, he was threatened to be fired so many no, times. No, it was a Jetson. You're fired, but he would always like get rehired, like in the same scene. Like yeah, they were just abusing George Jetson. Like, that's bad. Yes, and then the funniest thing is like the plot of this game, for the most part, and the scope of the Jetsons universe almost makes sense because <laughs> they had him in a number of like outlandish scenarios. Like, there was an episode I'll never forget where Spacely had an invention. In his lab to shrink cogs to reduce cost in shipping. Okay. And it accidentally hit George with the beam, so George was shrunk down to like a minuscule person size. So the boss, you know, at this point, li- liable for all sorts of like violations, still is like, well, until we can get you back to size, how about you go and spy on Cogswell Cogs for me? <laughs> so he ends up going on this whole espionage mission where he's like micro George Jetson. He goes home with his family as micro George Jetson and he goes on the espionage mission as micro George Jetson. Like nothing's going wrong. Nothing's weird about this at all in the world of the Jetsons. You know, his pay hasn't increased. He he goes on this dangerous mission. In fact, if anything, it's gotten smaller. It's gotten oh, <laughs> shrunk his pay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but like he never got a pay raise. He never got promoted. I mean, that's true. We never, we never got to see that on camera. But <laughs> it, I mean, all we ever saw in the opening was him like losing all of his money, paying out to his family. So he worked for Spacely Sprockets. Yeah, Spacely Space Sprockets. So and they made sprockets. Well, I mean, I'm assuming are like little oh, and then little co- gears, little gears, and cogs were also little gears, right? Yeah, which so was they, cogs, well, cogs. So they were. So this came out. Was this was the 60s or 70s? The show. Yeah, I think it was the early 70s. Early 70s. So they believed that the future was all machines mm-hmm. with that, flying cars, and that what you need are lots of tiny little gears to make it all work. I don't think they were tiny gears in that world. It was just that episode he wanted to shrink the gears. No, but I mean like cogs. Well, cogs, that's what they made. Sprockets, that's what they made. So it was, it's funny to me that like, that's what the future they envisioned. That's what it would take to do it. But like nowadays, we know that like it, the cogs, well, cogs is just IBM. <laughs> and what he's really building or selling is just capacitors. When is the last time you saw a gear? Right. Like an actual gear. Like I don't uh, think the gear shift of the car has gears in it. <laughs> well, I mean... Real small ones, um, maybe. I don't know anything about cars. Me neither, but some watches yeah, I bet, do I bet it. Electric Boogaloo does. Swiss, Swiss, <laughs> Swiss, 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 Swiss watches will do it, but nowadays people are wearing like, like are those, those Apple watches. Apple watches, yeah, or Fitbits. Like the we, last we've gone, time. we've gone back to digital. When is the last time someone saw a <laughs> gear or a car? I got really into trying to find like classic digital watches mm-hmm. because I. I feel like I would like to wear a watch. I thought that would look nice, but I don't want um, a newer. I don't want like a like a analog watch, and I don't want a newer digital watch. I want to find like a classic digital watch. See, I need to. I need to go all the way back. If I'm, gonna, if I'm going to wear yeah. a watch for a fashion statement, it's got to have the tick tick yeah. tick tock. I need the arms. I need that full feel. I actually still oh, no, own a watch for that exact purpose. So this is the one I found. It was at an estate sale. Um, it's a Psycho. And it's, it's, you uh, might want to be careful with yeah. it, it might cut you. But it, I, just, I gotta figure out a way to change the battery on it. But I love this thing, it just looks so cool. Oh, it looks, oh, it does look like nice and retro style. Pulse. Yes, touch, it has a touch sensor. Yeah, all these things have like these extra little things. So, this one, you put your thumb on it and it reads your pulse. Some of them actually, you could take it and stick it on a, a little mini computer and you can type notes into it and then save the notes to your watch. That's like, pretty cool. How 80s is that? Like, that's so cool. <laughs> People probably paid like 300 bucks for that watch back in the day. Yeah. You got it for a song. But uh, but yeah, that's what I meant to. I don't... I, I understand the the appeal of 
having the iPhone information on your wrist, but I don't think I want to like. I only want it temporarily, just so I can feel like Inspector Gadget, like I always dreamed. Yes. Because that's the one cartoon future thing that actually came to pass. That's well, Inspector Gadget would talk into his watch. No, well, and Penny had the computer book, and we have iPads. Yep. So that, that worked out. So Inspector Gadget actually came true, except for the man walking around with like gadgets in his body. Yeah, well, we're getting close, though. I mean, that's something I am working on. I mean... Get it done, man. I want a boxing glove to come out of my hat <laughs> next week. With <laughs> like the big, um, uh, the extendable arm with the box yes, of on it. I would love that. That would be so convenient, be and just, it would just get tangled up and everything. Because I'm already tall enough. It's so it. dangerous. No one will, no one will insure you. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine by me. Save me some. I'll insure myself with my extendo arm. All right, we're rolling into our uh, my last track. Uh, back to the eight bit territory. This is one of my favorite games, and one of the one of the coolest games on the NES is Metal Storm. This is Stage Four, composed by Toru Watanabe. shorty track this is stage four from the game metal storm for the nes composed by toru watanabe i am glad to hear that one of us is choosing tracks to keep the, put the timing of the show down <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> i just i didn't i didn't mean to choose shorter tracks to keep it short <laughs> <laughs> Unintentionally doing the doing the do to keep. Well, the show I was like, I, I, for some reason, in my mind, yeah, I was gonna play eight bit tracks, and I was like, you know what? If I want to do one of the cooler like platforming side scrolling games on NES, it's gotta be Metal Storm because you're constantly changing gravity. It's got this really cool anime mecha style, which like back when this came out, when we were little, like like that was awesome. I mean, yes, you didn't was. you didn't really see this stuff all the time. That is true because. Yeah. I mean, there was in Japan. There were still like a fair number of like TV shows that worked mm. with like mecha, like combat and yeah. stuff. But and in we the had States, Voltron. we had Voltron, which was pilfered from them. But, no, but then we also had Robotech. Yeah, but all of those things were from like technically from like the early '80s, late '70s. Yeah. So like, but in the late '80s, early '90s, yeah, there wasn't what much. really was there? I can't think of too much. Yeah, yeah, they finally made a comeback later on. But like, I was really into the Robotech stuff, so. Like seeing this again when I was younger, I was like, "Oh, this is cool." And I think I didn't think I think this got like on a cover of like a Nintendo Power at some point. It wasn't. It wasn't Nintendo Power cover. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know, it's just one of those like really slick looking games. It's not long. Would it's Bionic just, Six count as Mecha? I mean, technically they were people wearing bum, you know, bio suits that had things augmented to them. Bionic Six. It bio- ooh ooh. It was a family, and they all had suits. And the suits had stuff, or maybe I'm thinking about Centurions as far as like the stuff binding to them. Okay, I've never heard of Bionic Six before. This looks Bionic, Bionic Six. Okay, oh, oh, so, what's happening there in that picture? So I remember <laughs> Bionic Six, but I was wrong about what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about Centurions. Yes, yeah, so the Centurions. I would not say they're Mecha. I would say that they are. They're not Mecha because they, they had the suits, but the suits had like Mecha parts that would bind to the suit. Which allowed them to do different things. Yeah, but I mean, that was, yeah, essentially they were like little Lego people, except there was one guy who could only go in the water, and so like they had to make sure that there was like a lake or a river. <laughs> it was a water related <laughs> issue that took place. <laughs> like, that, that was straight He's up. He's escaping it. into the river. But I mean, like, they were like Lego people that you attach like guns and stuff to. So they were they were just to sell toys. Oh, oh most of those shows were to sell oh, toys. Oh, that's right. They had like a friend monkey, they had a monkey friend. Because they had to have an animal mascot. Yeah. That was also an Oh, animal. that's right. Yeah. I remember Silverhawks. That one I remember very little of. I, I just, just remember of their existence. I remember like like the um they, they did PSAs at the end of every episode, but they were always really long. Like six like or seven. Like, the episode. like it was most of the episode. And they would always go, Silverhawks. And it was just so cheesy. I don't know what they <laughs> I think they just had spaceships or something. Anyway. From the desk of Silverhawk Jim. Yeah. 
All right, so I'm going to turn Metal Storm down. Poor Metal Storm. Never got a chance in this world. And we're going to the bonus round. Whoa, bonus round. Ooh, ooh. We play good music. We play it right. Make that music play in your ears. <laughs> no. Oh. Okay, was Hope there you like it? Was there a tune in your head? Did you buy it? 60. A family brought together by faith and given superpowers to the miracle of modern science. I'm going to have to find the theme song and like, like kind of put that back. Like a back <laughs> track. Um, the bonus rounds where we play covers and remixes and arrangements on our theme. I, got, I won 16-bit here. Okay. All right, so what, what you got? What you got? Well, this might be cheating because, frankly, the timing was perfect. I've been wanting to play Lame Genie on the show again for a while. Oh, now, yeah. I'm terrible at like picking their stuff. I'm always picking like weird stuff, and they don't <laughs> pick the weird stuff. They do like... They do common stuff, but they, they do really well. well they do Except s- for like I'm Jam and Lamb, and they have their moments. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. It, we, we just haven't been crossing paths recently. But today is different because today I'm in 16-bit territory, yeah. and they reign supreme in there. That's true. And this track actually comes from Mega Man X, which is one of the primo platformers of the 16-bit era. This is the Armored Armadillo theme <laughs> done up by Lame Genie, the comedy clowns of catastrophic comical yeah. guitar cacophony c yeah, but, word but they're the, but their drummer man has got like arms like tanks he's got like two tanks on his torso oh yeah and his turrets are just beating the drums yeah just beating the drums mine car ride let me tell you what Ooh. anyway this was the arm and armadillo theme from lame genie originally it existed within the game Mega Man x but then they put their lame genie spin on top of it hmm. and suffice to say they did a ridiculously good job we were talking about on the off pit where the arm and armadillo theme is actually fairly short but i like when bands take otherwise short loops and extend them out by adding various layers to yeah. it. They have like measures where it's like, okay, this part we, we're going to put more emphasis on the bass guitar. Yeah. This is the part where we go on like in the corner, like a power ballad. Or they do my favorite thing where let's break it down and just go half time, but then like get really heavy with the drums and then then suddenly bring it back real fast again. <laughs> See, <laughs> I love that. Use words like half time. You know what you're talking half-time, about. Half time. I'm yeah. making up words. Like I'm at, I'm at this point where I'm like, this sounds crunchy. You know, instead of the snare on the one, on the, on the two and the four. See, I'm, I don't know about that. I'm like, it's, it's at one point where he hits the drum hard, and then he hits the drum a little bit harder. And it's like, wow. Mm. You know what I'm talking about. You know. <laughs> I know it sounds awesome yeah. and technical. It's good. It's They are technically good. Like, they, they, like, I don't know. It's just something about 
like maybe it's the way it's mixed or just the how good they are with their instruments but it's technically like spot on every time yes it I is love i love stuff. the fact that they they have a they have the ability because I think that's one of their Patreon things where mm. someone will just say do this track yeah if you and give they'll them enough just money, like collectively <laughs> get together and like a week just like here you go <laughs> yeah I think that, that's great that's a great way for them to maybe make a little extra cra- uh, scratch too oh yeah I want to say crack make a little extra crack <laughs> Jesus crap I, it's no it's, it's, it's because we're getting late it's getting late uh, but no they're having the crack it's uh, Irish they're having fun uh, uh. okay so my next track is the exact opposite of this one this was core re- blind. This is Joshua Morse. This is a jazz track. Uh, this was released on the Game Chops label just a week ago. I think it was like five or six days ago. This is a yet another Donkey Kong Country 2 Aquatic <laughs> Ambience uh, uh, cover. Is that what it's actually called? Yet another Donkey Kong Country 2 Aquatic Ambience mm-hmm. remix slash cover? No, this one is Exploring the Coral Capers, which oh, is Aquatic should. Ambience, which, I mean, has been done a lot. They but totally should have called it Yet Another Aquatic Ambience. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's a lot of them out there. But Joshua, when Joshua Morse does one, it's it's different. It's always going to be different. So here we go. This is Exploring the Coral Capers, Aquatic Ambience from Donkey Kong Country 2. <laughs>
was Exploring the Coral Capers, which is Aquatic Ambience from Donkey Kong Country 2. That was arranged by Joshua Morse, composed by David Wise. That was legitimately good. Like, I think it's yeah. funny. Like, I stand by the belief that it should have been titled Donkey Kong Country 2, yet, uh, yet another Donkey Kong Country 2 Aquatic Ambiance remix slash cover. Yeah. But... <laughs> despite that it doesn't matter because it was just that good it was that good and i hope you liked it too uh listeners out there in radio world <laughs> <laughs> out there radio lay listening wherever you are i hope that that chilled you out after that lame genie like little adrenaline hit <laughs> I, I can see that being the case it's like you had the workout <clears throat> and now it's the cool down yeah you gotta have a cool down set all right so for more information on the bonus round of our show, go to rhythmandpixels.com. We have links to all of the artists, band camps, and sound clouds and bios everywhere where you can find the music and support the artists. All right, thanks for joining us on episode 28-5 of Rhythm and Pixels. This is our summer of 16-bit kickoff on platformers. That's kick, right. Kick off, the, ma- the kick, kick master off. <laughs> the kick master. Oh, my God. Bootsy Collins approves. Bootsy Collins approves of the kick master. In fact, they're related. They know each other. Bootsy Collins uh, uh, gave kick master his first boots, <laughs> his magical funk boots. Oh, mercy. <laughs> That's how you know it's getting late. <laughs> I was like, no comment. You gotta get on that that, that bass on that Josh Joshua Morse track was really good. That was a uh, not Bootsy Collins bass, but that was a good bass. We gotta think about what we're gonna come up with for like future stuff too, because now I think about it, it's like we've got at least three more summer of sixteen bit things. We can do. We don't go beyond that. Funky sixteen bit. That would be really hard. That's that's like hyper narrow. <laughs> hyper narrow. It is a bit narrow, but man, that one track you picked from Kid Chameleon. Oh yeah, but that would have been the track I'd have picked from Funky Track. <laughs> yeah, so I'm already true. I'm already exhausted by options. Yeah. Well, if you've got um, an idea for a topic, let us know on our email, and we'll have a day to figure it out. So send us an email. <laughs> so send us an email. Rhythmpixels at hotmail um, and if you want more information about our show, a full track listing from all of our episodes and access to all of the other stuff that we're doing, go to the website, rhythmandpixels.com. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, all those places is Rhythm and Pixels. And you can also find us on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Rhythm and Pixels. Uh, we also have there is running as a 24-7, 8-bit and 16-bit, 16-bit oh. uh, classic and deep cuts radio station. You know that for now? I did, but then promptly forgot. But now I remember again. It's actually running in the closet right next to you, right now. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't burned out yet. Because that's an amazing go get them laptop. Yeah, it's 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 putting in the work. It's I, I, it's doing a lot of what I've asked it to do. In fact, it's it's had a long life before <laughs> before I asked it to do this, and it's still going. Maybe in a sense, maybe it's like this is an easy job because it's it just has gotten used to what it's supposed to do. It doesn't have to change the routine. Right? Yeah, it knows when it's it knows when it's going to clock out for lunch. It's no one it knows when it's going to come back. It's yeah. rather, rather than the like, system. Okay, this day we're playing Netflix. All right, and this day you got, we're doing our taxes. I'm like, oh man, it's too much work. It gets and then before it gave me to us, it was my father-in-law's, and he he was working on that thing too. So that's probably where he got his work ethic from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so also, if you want to support the show, uh, you can go to rhythmandpixels.com slash merch. And we have some awesome t-shirts related to the show, related to video game music, related to the uh, the company's sound teams, like Falcom, right? Mm-hmm. Like uh, the Konami Kukahea Club. Right. Right, like Zuntada, the Taito, right. Taito Club, right? Um, what, was, what was the other one? Right. Yeah, right. You can also go to patreon.com slash rhythm and pixels. And as a member there. Right. <laughs> you get it's like you're like, I sound like a frog now. <laughs> as a member there, you get access to a weekly uh, prequel episode of me and Pernell just chatting. Um, this week, I'm probably going to do some editing and move things, some things around. But um, we have a weekly chat. And then we also get access to a monthly live stream episode where we record the show in front of you as a live audience. It gets released as a normal episode, 
So you're still going to hear it. But as being a member, you get to hang out with us and get all the stupid visual gags. You can chat with us while the show's going on. And the conversations sometimes are being pretty interesting in those dialogues, yeah. too. And it's something to like hear our voice, but like our sexy, sexy, manly voices. But then to actually see us, it's something else. It's a sight. It's a I think sight it's funny. I was about to say it because yeah. I, just, I just like seeing everybody <laughs> chat. But at the same time, since it's a whole Patreon thing, it feels weird. Like, how do you sell this on somebody? Well, it'd be cool to see you chatting in the group. <laughs> like, that's the how you sell it. Well, 30 minutes into the show, we may take our shirts off. We're 40 minutes into the show. I'm trying to sell them on the idea, Rob. the ice bucket challenge. Nah, they, that's they, more they like just, They just don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. So wet t-shirts. No, no. Wet <laughs> ice buckets. Stick with, stick with the challenges. Um, hot, hot sauces and stuff. So all members at all... Uh, all member levels get access to that stuff. At the all high- jokes aside, though, we got to do that at some point. The ice bucket challenge? No, You're that'd on be your too own. messy for the room. Hot sauces. Oh, hot? No. On the episode, on the live live stream. Yeah, buddy. Okay. Well, you know what? I don't know. I got. Let me think about that one. Hot sauces <laughs> on a live stream for the episode. Yeah. At the end of the episode, no, I don't. No, you got to do the whole. You got to be like, on oh, the next when track I, is. I can't remember what the track name. That's. I'm going to push the, the button the, real the, soon. The mouth noises that I would be making would be disgusting. That's what editing is for. You fix it post. Oh, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so if you're a member of our Patreon and you get access to all that stuff, no matter what level, at the highest levels, you can get a quick shout out on our uh, radio station as a kind of like a we do like a station ID every five or six songs. Um, you can get your own shout outs at the highest level you can actually record your own and send it to me and I'll do very little editing and just stick it on there and uh, that's really cool and also at the highest levels of our Patreon we like to thank you at the end of every episode and so these people are all very special to me for now to me to me frankly Zappa (laughs) so frankly Zappa Mike Myers Vashon8060 that Nick Walker Ed Wilson of the VG Embassy Matt's Holmquist, Michael Jennings, Davey Cakes, Justin Schneider from XVGM Radio, which, which we had uh, guested on not, not too long ago. That is right. We're talking about Adventure Island and Adventure Island Part 2 and Adventure Island Part 4. No, you're, you're skipping Monster Boy. Monster Boy's Wonder in Boy somewhere. Wonder Boy is the real deal. Yeah, Wonder Boy's in there somewhere. Oh, g- 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 you. Uh, <laughs> Sonic Medley, Taco, Harold Howard, Dave Taylor, Reinhard Selkova, Andreas Milberg, Dan Loughton, um, who's also known as the Phantom Meyer on Twitch. Uh, just speed running all sorts of gift stuff. Well, with, with great reckless abandon. Yeah, dude. man. He doesn't hold back. He is killing it on there. Phantom Meyer, P H A N. Phantom Meyer. Um, and then you got Sleepy S'more, Steve Miller, The Autistic Gamer 89, Cameron Worma, Christopher Sensrum, Bobby Arson from One Up Funk. Check him out on Instagram at One Up Funk. Uh, Wicked Sephiroth, Carlos, Kung Fu Carlito from the Heroes 3 podcast. Not a VGM podcast, but a podcast about Asian cinema and Kung Fu movies. Kicking. Lots of kicks. L- lots of kickings. Yeah. Some of which have mastered the art of kicking. <laughs> lots of movies with lots of kickings. Um, but he's just a fan of video no games column. and game music. Um, uh, and we also have Michael Bridgewater from the, from the Forever Sound version VGM podcast, which hasn't been around for a long time. Uh, but he is uh, Mebri, Mebri64 on Twitch holding it down for the demo scene crew over in England. And we have Brian Pitt. All of you, thank you so much for your continued support of our show. And thanks for listening this far to our show. It's been a while. We've been at this for a minute. Yeah. And we're going to be at it for other minutes. Well, I just I just meant this episode, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> this is like episode 280s, I think, or something like that. Never saw that as a thing when it was like way back. Like, you want to do a show? Sure. Yeah. Dun, 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 Let's dun, just do dun. it. <laughs> Just keep going. Don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> See, if you stop, we'll stop breathing. And we're like, we're like podcast sharks. <laughs> that would be just disturbing. It's like they can only swim in the waters of VGM podcast. Oh, man. This is why I don't schedule anything after 9 o'clock anymore. <laughs> it's a dangerous game. I like to work out in the morning. That's just bad news. Um, what time do you wake up? Like 5? No, between 5 and 6. Ooh. Yeah, I think it's just just so that I can get like workout gym time or DDR in before I actually like start work. I mean, some people say that's a really effective tool to get get the day going. I think I think anything, so. Yeah, evening workout people are the minority in the spectrum. I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot that do it, but uh, yeah, it does get it does get my brain moving. But then, unfortunately, by like nine ten o'clock, my brain stops moving. <laughs> But the gear, like the gear stop yeah, churning, yeah, your the, cogs the, stop cogging. The hamster on the wheels getting tired needs a nap. <laughs> 
Jetson gets fired again. <laughs> All right. No more talk about this Jetson man. <laughs> <laughs> but George is a good one. Um, yeah. That's the name of a horse. That's that's that's, I see, that's one thing I just Bill thought Pony. about. How many people listening to this show are like, I've never heard of the Jetsons? I wonder. Probably probably not many. I don't know I, like they're in the 20s, maybe? Never heard of the Jetsons, I bet. <sighs> no, but I mean, like we, I'm sure our show attracts people of a similar age. Yeah, I, got some youngins. I, I mean... By youngins, what you mean, like thirties? Like twenties. Twenties? I bet we've got some twenty-year-olds. No. A, a twenty. I'm leaving. 20s. I'm leaving all this in the episode. I bet we've got <laughs> some twenties that listen to the show. Okay. Would not be surprised. Maybe we should just do TikToks from now on. No, God, no! We I could, would run know, the material so fast. Do you know how many we could do in a week? If one, we, we do like an hour and a half long show. We, you know how many TikToks that would be? No, but TikToks <laughs> involve like a lot of elaborate nonsense, like no a guy way. walking in the hall saying, "I got fries." You play, you play, you play aquatic ambience, and then like someone like gets hit with a pie. Yeah, gets hit with a pie, or they open like a, a they open a, a a bottle of soda, and they go sheesh. But then you've already used up every episode idea we've got, right there, right there. Well, then we just do it over and over again. People it's a different love songs. it. It's just it's it's a derivative format. It's and people love it. People love it. We can do it, and then we'll become we'll become influencers, and people will give us. Stuff. Oh, that would be nice. Like Mentos. <laughs> I could be a fresh maker. You could be the. You could be the fresh maker. That sounds nice. That sounds very appealing to me, actually. Thanks for listening to the show. My name is Rob Nichols, and I'm soon to be the fresh maker. Uh, we'll see you next week. Be safe, and we'll talk to you next time. And remember, very simple. No, it's, this is a very light one. Oh, just yeah, based yeah. off the idea of like the last thing I just dealt with. If you make a promise to a friend, to your <laughs> folks, if you do a thing, if you say you're going to do something, you freaking do it. You gonna read this man's name on the episode? No, I'm not <laughs> going to read it because it's not even a real name. It was like a, it was a it was a fake name that the person yeah, yeah, used. Yeah, yeah. But being a jerk on the internet, ain't serving nobody, doing nobody any favors. Yeah. Help a turtle cross the road if you want to feel good about yourself. You don't feel good by being a jerk. And if you make a promise to somebody, you fulfill it. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, you do it. Simple as that. It's not hard. You want to be someone people can look at and go, such and such. Oh, yeah, they're awesome. I can trust them with my life. Or, yeah, I'd give that guy some Mentos. He's quite the fresh maker. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't be a jerk. That's, that's my thing. Yeah, give Pernell your money. If you promised him money... I'm gonna this this next auction is gonna succeed, don't yeah, you? Okay. Cause I, if I, if you got a zero karma, you're getting out of my auction. <laughs> Get out. You ain't gonna mess with that anymore. Yeah.